All right, so in so many of our projects, we take for granted a lot of the JavaScript uh, syntax that we are using. However, uh, I think it's important to understand what's going on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the import and export statements that are part of um, ES6 or ES2016, depending on who you talk to. So a lot of this, um, well, import and export is not commonly implemented in browsers as of right now. Um, I think we're starting to see it more and more, but we still have to use a transpilation process using Babel to turn this back into ES5 syntax so that we can be sure that it runs in all of the browsers that our clients require. Um, having said that, it is safe to use in all of our projects because we do have the transpilation in place. And uh, I've got this daily training project, which is just a derivative of our, our React client starter app. Um, all of the build process is already in place inside of these applications, so you don't have to go do that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how import and export work. You'll notice here at the top of this file, I have an import React from React. Now that seems like a little bit of, a, of magic, and in many ways it is. So in the olden days, we would write JavaScript in a way that um, looked something more like this. You'd have a script, let me make this a little bit bigger. You have a script and some source equals some JavaScript file and maybe that would be jQuery, um, JS, and I'm, you know, you'd have to have type and everything else in here, but I'm just going for shorthand. Uh, and then maybe if you wanted to use jQuery UI, you would include that, but you'd have to be very careful to remember that jQuery UI shows up after jQuery. And then, you know, your code here. And in the early days of writing JavaScript, that was fine because we would only use one or two libraries. However, over time, our JavaScript applications have become more and more complicated and more and more um, intense in their development process. So I've seen some projects that start to look like this, where these aren't all j jQuery UI, there's like some jQuery plugin one and jQuery plugin two, and so on and so forth. Anyway, you get the idea. So, and even in this with just nine lines of code in here, um, this starts to become difficult to manage because what if this code depends on this code, but maybe this code on this include depends on this guy for the developer, what that means is you have to be very careful about the order that you include your JavaScript. And all of this stuff is global, right? So it's all put into the global namespace. So by virtue of including jQuery, I have this global thing that's a dollar sign, that's a jQuery, and then I can do jQuery stuff. This becomes really, really difficult when there are hundreds of lines of these things. And we've worked on projects where there are literally 200 lines of JavaScript includes. So you go to add a new piece of code and you have to figure out where to include your JavaScript because you have no idea who depends on who. And if you ever have to refactor that because uh, maybe the library's gotten too big and you know there are libraries that are not being used, then it becomes a nightmare to go back and figure out who depends on who, and at that point, you're, you're kind of up a creek. So, in this new paradigm of development, we use this import statement. And by declaring which libraries I need at the top of this file, I know exactly what my code is going to depend on. So somebody coming along later who wants to read this code will know that this file does indeed depend on React and something from assets, and I can come over here and look, and I can see the path for that. And then there's this request, and that comes from SuperAgent, and there's this weird underscore thing here that comes from a library called Lodash. And um, in fact, in this code, these three right here 
come from the node modules folder because we're using npm. So I do an npm install uh, dash dash save react, and now that gets put into the package JSON file, so that later on when somebody else does an npm install, React will be installed into the node modules folder. Um, and then when I go to use it, all I have to do is say, just import that React. Now that's because we've set up a specific build process that says, hey, by default, go look in the node modules directory so that people don't have to put in big ugly URLs that look something like this, or big paths, sorry, paths that look like this. Um, we don't wanna to have to do this. We just wanna be able to import React. So as part of our build process, we tell the build tool include the node modules in kind of a default path, and then if no path is specified, go look for it. Go look for React or Super Agent, whatever there. Okay, so import saves us from this dependency nightmare of having to figure out uh, who depends on who, and we let the build tools instead worry about that, and we can tell from the import statements at the top of our file exactly what is needed to run the code inside of this file. All right, so then, I can see I've imported the entire React library here. I've imported the entire SuperAgent library, the entire Lodash library. Lodash, for example, is a very large library. And if I look in my code down here, I can see, oh, we're using map from Lodash and we're using find. So we're only actually using two functions from Lodash. Um, so we can refactor that. Let me just show you really quickly here. This is our code. And you might recognize this if you were watching some of the React basic episodes. We've been integrating with the IMDB API. So here it is functioning. Just wanted to prove that it actually works. So now instead of importing the entire Lodash library, we can instead say, let's import only the parts that we need. So we know we're using map and we're using find. So let's just import map and find. And notice that I've named them um, map and find because I know that they're called map and find inside of Lodash. So we'll talk more about that here in one second. But then I can do this instead. Where I call map and I call find and save that code. And lo and behold, everything still works. Now, I actually don't recommend doing this um, because it can be a little bit challenging to remember all of the different methods that you need. Um, and you're probably at some point going to want to use other Lodash methods in your code. So just go ahead and import Lodash. As part of the build process, we actually have um, options where we can throw away unused code. So it, do, it becomes less necessary to import specific parts of a given library, um, and instead we let the build process worry about all of the really dirty details of optimization. Uh, I just wanted to show that so that you know that you can import an entire library, or you can import specific um, items from a given uh, module. So let's look a little bit about um, into how you write these modules. I've got this action types uh, set of constants right here. So if you're using Redux or Flux, you probably have a constants file. Don't worry about this part of the code. Let's just look at this part right here. So you'll notice I'm doing an export default, and this is a function. Uh, if I wanted to simplify this, I could say uh, something more like export default default, and maybe we just export this array right here. What that says is, Everything inside of this file is off limits, except for action types, because that's all that I'm going to let the outside world see. This is nice because nothing in here gets dumped into the global namespace. Uh, if you were to write just plain old JavaScript code and use script include tags, action types would be part of the global namespace. Async action types would be part of the global namespace, which is a problem because if I go look at See, we don't have any in this project. Um, if I add another constants file that also has action types and async action types, 
it will override the values that I had already put in in this file. And so you have this conflict. And that's bad because then you end up with unpredictable results. When I use this export, I say, ignore this stuff. The outside world can't see this. Only send this to the outside world. This is the only thing the outside world can see. And then when I import that, let's see, action types. For example, right here, let's look at this one. In this messages.js, notice that I import action types from constants action types. So action types, will be the result of this method call right here, which in fact is just a, a hash, an object that has these refre refresh JWT add message, just has those as keys. So then in here, I can just do things like action types that add message. Um, what's interesting is because I did an export default, I could call this anything I want. So it doesn't have to be called action types. I could call it constants, for example. What's neat here is that the author of the module of the code that consumes this library can name this however they like. And again, because of how we put all this stuff together, this won't conflict with another thing named constants in a different file. Because notice we're exporting specific functions from this file. So this is a little bit different. There are two kinds of ways to export functionality from a given file. And we saw the first one with this export default right here. And when you use export default, you'll typically only export one thing from a file. The other way is to export names, export specific things from a given file, whether those are functions or constants or variables, you can export anything you'd like. In this case, we export two functions. So I'm exporting add message and I'm exporting clear messages. So now if I want to use add message in another piece of code, I can go to, let's see, let's go into this piece of code and let's say import. You have to use the curly bra brackets here. If you don't, you'll end up with all kinds of weird errors. Uh, let's import add message. Okay, so I've imported add message specifically from actions message, and that will bring only this function, not this function, only this function into this file. Notice I use these brackets. That's called destructuring in ES6. Uh, it's the same as if I, you'll, you'll see destructuring in a number of places. So if I had declared um, an object, let's see this and I do something like this and then later on I want to get values from that but I only want one value I can do something like this and that will extract the value one out of this object and put it into this variable notice how the names match right so now one here um, it's going to be equal to one from, from this guy right here. So that's essentially what's happening here. It's the same thing. This module um, called uh, message that we wrote, this guy sitting right here that exports these two functions, when it is exported will essentially look something like this. And then if I only want the single function, this add message, I use that same destructuring capability and I say, just give me add message. And then add message will be this function. Now the question becomes, well, what if I actually want all of the methods? And we can do that too. So I can say import star, meaning everything, as message actions from that module. And now this message actions is basically this guy right here. 
So if I come over into this other file. Message actions is going to look like this right here. So then I can use that in my code if I want to call one of those functions down in here, wherever I'm going to do that. Um, I could do message actions dot add message and call the function. So just a quick recap. There are two ways to export your functionality from a given file. The first is export default. So I can do export default and maybe I export just a simple object and that could be like that. I can also do, um, and I'm using the keyword const which is also not part of ES5, it's part of ES6. Uh, it gets transpiled back to var, so I could also say var. It's just nice to use const if I know a value isn't going to change. So I could do export default const and give it um, like add user if that was the name of my function and that's going to equal some function and you know you can do stuff to add the user inside of here. So number one export default when I import that code it'll look something like this import um, one, actually that's a bad example, import data from wherever that file lives. So let's pretend this is called um, data.js. So I would import data from such data, like that. And if I did that, data is going to equal that, this right here. In this example right here, let's call this functions.js. When I consume that, I will do import, potentially add user from functions.js, or I can also do import um, user functions, oops, import star as user functions from functions.js. All right, and that's how import and export work in ES6. So it gets really easy to choose one or the other and always use it and just think, oh, that's some magic that happens in the background. But uh, you pick the one that is most relevant to the code that you're writing. So if you're writing a file with a whole bunch of functions, you should export each one of those functions individually. And then let the consumer of your code choose whether they want all of the functions or just one of the functions. If, however, you're writing something more like this home JSX, um, where there's a single class, and notice we do this, export home as default down. Export home as default. Uh, then you would, if there's just a single class or module or, or function in that file, then export that thing as the default. Uh, we did this down here at the bottom. You could have also just done uh, export default class right there. So either syntax works. It just depends on which you prefer.